whose hand has led through shadows drear and while it leads I have no fear I know it will lead me to that home where sin
good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Good to see this good number out. We appreciate all of you being here and uh, appreciate our veterans. We want to say thank you again. We appreciate you and love you and uh, thankful this morning that we're still living in a free country where we have the ability to gather and worship uh, God by the dictations of our own conscience and by the word of God as best we see fit. It's a uh, special honor this morning. We've done this, I guess, every year I've been here at Zion. Had a Gideon speaker come and give us a report from uh, the Lumpkin County Gideons and tell us what they've done. And we've got Brother Doug Caldwell with us this morning. Going to turn it over to him and you lift him up in prayer as he shares with us what the Gideons have been doing in Lumpkin County. Doug, come up here. Thank you for uh, letting the Gideons come and share with you this morning and the, uh, the cards from the veterans are special, very special. Uh, since we're talking about memories this morning, let me ask a question. How many in the congregation can remember 1955? Well, I can too. Well, this, uh, this King James Bible made its way into a uh, hotel room in Terre Haute, Indiana in 1955. And 67 years later, some way, somehow, it found its way to the small town of Delonga on the square. And my daughter was, uh, my granddaughter was shopping this summer and seen it was a place for the Gideon, so she uh, got it for me. Amen. So it's a little bit worn and torn, you can tell, but on the binder of this uh, old Bible, Got a few testimonies from some great Americans I want to share with you briefly. The first one was Thomas Jefferson's testimony. He said, The studious perusal of the sacred volume will make better citizens. Amen to that. Amen. Abraham Lincoln, the Bible is the best book God has given. Amen. U.S. Grant, hold fast to the Bible as a she anchor of your liberty. Through the influence of this book, we are embedded for the progress made in civilization, and to this we must look as our guide in the future. Last, Woodrow Wilson. When you have read the Bible, you will know that it is the Word of God, because you will have found it the key to your own heart, your own happiness, and your own duty. Amen. Up there on the top, Right hand corner of the Gideon Bible on the binder of it, the mission of the Gideons in 1955 was to have a Bible in every school room in the nation. And this morning, the Gideon mission really hasn't changed. The sole purpose of the Gideon ministry is getting the Word of God into the hands of boys, girls, men, and women who have ever never heard the gospel or never really go to church. The um, primary distribution for the Gideons is to place Bibles in hotels, in hospitals, nursing homes, and jails, military personnel, fifth graders in elementary school, and college students. There were two Gideons on a college campus in Austin, Texas, not long ago, making a distribution. And near the end of that distribution, a young lady walked up to them and asked them if they knew any Gideons in a nearby town. They told her they did. She shared with him she had a friend there, his name was Bobby Cord, that Bobby was in the hospital there and he had leukemia and he wasn't expected to live. She asked the men if they had anybody could go visit him. She began to cry and she told them that Bobby didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Well, after the distribution, the two men decided they would go visit Bobby. They prayed they'd have access to get in and see him. Well, the men said when they walked into the room, said there sat a handsome, fairly healthy young man sitting on the side of the bed. They told him who they were and that his friend from college had asked him to come visit him. And they asked Bobby if he knew the Lord Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. No, I do not. He said his mother had talked with him about the Lord and his mother's pastor had been to visit him and talked with him about the Lord. 
So the two men shared some scriptures with Bobby, prayed with him, spent time with him. And one of the men said at each point during the uh, telling him about the Lord Jesus Christ, they thought he might accept Christ as his Savior. Bobby said no. He said, if I wasn't in this hospital in the condition I'm in, there's no way I'd make that kind of commitment. He said, I feel like if I did, I'd be a hypocrite. The two men started to leave, and one of the men had one of the little small Bibles, and he gave it to Bobby, and he asked Bobby, he says, would you read the book of John after we're gone? Bobby Ford says, I promise you I'll read the book of John. The men left and continued to pray for Bobby. Time passed. One morning, one of the Gideons was coming through their local newspaper, noticed in the obituary where Robert Bobby Ford passed. Senior in high school, 17 years old, captain of the football team. He gave the funeral arrangements to the uh, family and the pastor in charge of the funeral. And that Gideon went straight to the phone and he called that pastor. He said, please tell me one thing. Did Bobby Ford make a profession of faith before he died? The pastor said, you might have been one of the men that came and see him in the hospital. He said, well, Bobby Ford did what he told you he'd do. He read the book of John. He says, I too went to visit Bobby that afternoon. Went with his mother. He says, when we walked in that hospital room, Bobby looked at his mother and says, Mama, I'm a Christian. I've been saved. Amen. So we praise God for his word sure. and church for your faithfulness in distributing that word and helping get it out, not only to hospitals here in the United States, but around the world. With the help of the local churches, the Gideon Ministry is now placing God's Word in 200 countries in 199 different languages. I spoke with Wanda when I came in, and she says it's a rack downstairs uh, with some little cards in it. Church, you may walk by that rack too many times you hardly <coughs> notice it's there. But inside that rack is some little cards. They're providing free of charge for the mission of the Gideons. You simply take one of those cards mail it to a friend or loved one for a special occasion like a birthday, graduation, or whatever. You can donate one Bible for $5 or five Bibles for $25. Those Bibles are then placed in a hotel here locally or abroad and have the original potential of reaching 2,300 souls over a six-year period. Every penny of every dollar that's given to the church goes 100% to the purchase and distribution of God's Word and Amen. nothing else. Amen. Now, Zan, we want to thank you personally and on behalf of the Gideon here in Winston County for your faithfulness in giving monthly to the Gideon. You never know what, what that little Bible or a big Bible who sold it to the church. Locally here in Lumpkin County, the Lumpkin County Camp so far this year at the Gold Rush Festival was able to give out 3,750 copies of the Word of God. Last weekend at the Clint Waters Memorial Car Show, 200 little testaments was given out. Amen. We're scheduled, if everything goes well, we desire your prayers. The Gideons is going to make a distribution at the University of North Georgia next week. And we're still able to get into the school for Lumpkin County, so we praise God for that. In closing, there was a Gideon making a large distribution to uh, one of the larger campuses in Port Alray, Brazil, not long ago, about 12,000 students. The men had their uh, stacks of Bibles at the main entrance of the college ready to distribute them, and they had started distributing them. When a young man walked up to him, fine dressed young fella, somebody had already give him a little Bible. And he began to do unkind gestures and began to curse the men. He didn't call them Bibles, he called them books. And he told them they could take all those books and do with them what he was going to do with his. So he took his little book or Bible and threw it up on the roof of a nearby building. Well, things like this happen. All we can do is pray for them. The distribution continued, and one of the Gideons said in a little while, he smelled a strange odor behind him. He turned around and looked, and there was a very short young man, had 
car all over him on his face, hands, clothes. And he was very emotional and crying. And he was holding the little Bible. And he told the men that he was up on the roof of a nearby building working, contemplating taking his own life because he was so messed up. But he says a miracle's happened. He says this little Bible fell out of the sky and hit me in the head. <laughs> and he had opened it up and found out that he could have hope. Amen. So one of the local Gideons there with him, who spoke the Porky G, Porky G language, began to share the word of God. With Amen. His, his name was Luke. After about 20 minutes staying in the word of God, he accepted Jesus as his personal Savior. Amen. So we thank God for your faithfulness in helping make that possible, church. If the Gideons can ever be of help, please call us or talk to Lamar about it. Yes, thank you very much. I can't compare to compete with that. Amen. I can give you the word of God, but I'm not going to throw my Bible at you. All right. So, um, but praise the Lord. You say stuff like that can't happen. You don't know my God then if you don't think things like that can happen. Turn in your Bible this morning to the book of Acts, chapter number 17. To try to <clears throat> bring you a message that the Lord's laid on our heart. What a wonderful day. We hear from the Gideons celebrating this morning our veterans. And uh, we're so thankful for the freedom that we have, as I've already said, in our country to worship God uh, according to our own conscience and according to the way that God leads us. And here we're going to read out of the book of Acts in chapter number 17, one of my favorite passages of Scripture in all the Word of God. And uh, if you've been reading along in the Bible reading with us by the month, this will be familiar with you. And if not, let me encourage you to pick up a bulletin that's on the table in the foyer. And you begin reading with us this month in the, uh, as we go through the epistles and into the book of Revelation. And uh, we'll finish out the New Testament this month reading... Uh, reading those passages together day by day, and it's been a great blessing. But here in the book of Acts, in chapter number 17, I, I, I want to say this, as we were reading this past month in October, I love, uh, and I said this Wednesday night in Bible study, that I love uh, the scripture, and I love to watch the life of the Apostle Paul. And as he advances the gospel, and God leads him, and uh, Peter also but it's an exciting thing to me to read and see how God used the Apostle Paul and, uh, and spread the gospel. And then here in Acts chapter 17 is one of the, uh, as I've already said, one of my favorite accounts out of the life of Paul of the gospel being preached. And uh, if you'll bear with me for just a minute, let me tell you where we're at in the life of the Apostle Paul. If you go back to chapter number 16 or the end of chapter 15, Paul and Silas began a second missionary work. Uh, Paul, it's his second missionary. Barnabas goes with him on the, the first missionary trip, and he chooses Silas, and Silas goes with him on his second missionary journey. And they begin to go through uh, uh, Eastern or, or Western Asia there, and he sees a dream, and... In chapter number 16, he sees a dream and he crosses over and he goes into Macedonia. And, he, and, and, and really what's happening there is he's leaving the continent of Asia and he's going to be the first minister to preach on the continent of Europe. And that happens in, verses, uh, in verse number 9 as he goes over into Macedonia and he preaches in uh, a city there. And a lady by the name of Lydia in Thyatira is the first convert of the gospel in Europe. And so the gospel spreads, and you can watch that gospel spread from Jerusalem up into Antioch of Syria, across uh, Western Asia, into uh, Europe there, and you can watch that spread and work, 
And Paul and Silas then, of course, you know the story how when they get to Philippi, they're beaten and thrown into prison. And we have the story of the conversion of the Philippian jailer. And then they continue on their journey. They go to uh, uh, Amphipolis there and Apollonia in chapter 17. And there they're met with resistance and they go into Berea and they're met with resistance there. And Paul leaves Timothy and Silas behind in in Berea, and Paul goes to the city of Athens, Greece. And that's where we find ourselves when we pick up in Acts chapter number 17. And I'm going to read a few verses beginning in verse number 16. The Bible says, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And I like the, the fact that Paul's spirit was stirred in him. Amen. He sees what's around him. Uh, Brother Donnie, and he sees what's going on, and rather than it depressing him, and rather than it making him mad, he gets fired up in the spirit and says, I'm going to do some preaching around here and see if I can't help these people. And so uh, he meets with the Epicureans and the Stoics, the philosophers of the day, and they carry him up into a, a place kind of like City Hall, if you'll let me say it like that, called the Areopagus, and he begins to uh, talk to them and in verse number 22 I want to pick up reading it says then, then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said ye men of Athens I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious for, I passed, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore you ignorantly worship him declare I unto you now let's just I'm going to get down to my thought here in just a minute, but I want to set a good stage for it. I want you to understand what's going on here. Paul is in the midst of one of the most learned and cultural, maybe the cultural capital of the world still today. All right? Of course, we know from our, uh, our studies in history and school that there was a lot of philosophy and a lot of false doctrine and a lot of idolatry that came out of Athens. We all are familiar with Greek mythology that was born and uh, that was uh, 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 brought and spread out of Athens. Paul said in, uh, or the Bible says in verse number 21, for all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but to tell or to hear of some new thing. In other words, they wanted to hear a new story. They wanted to hear about something new. They wanted to be the first to know this. And uh, that's what they were there for. And Paul comes on the scene and he begins to preach to them. And he says, I've uh, walked through uh, the sea. I've seen everything. He said, I've seen all your inscriptions. I've seen all your altars. Now, I want you to understand where Paul is at. And I've never been to Athens. You're going to have to talk to some of these world travelers uh, and some that are going to Athens, okay? And uh, some that are going to, uh, that have seen some major things and uh, uh, some ma and I would love to go see Athens. I'd like to see Mars Hill where Paul preached. Uh, but uh, around him, uh, uh, maybe, uh, and I've tried to study this a little bit and figure out where he was in Athens. Uh, uh, from what I can gather based on uh, where they believe this to be, that Paul was on a, a, the, the Areopagus and Mars Hill is an elevated part in the city. And you can see the majority of Athens around him. And uh, on one side, you can see uh, the Acropolis and all that stuff and all that uh, worship. And you can see the great buildings and the great architecture of the city. Overwhelming sights, no doubt. Uh, uh, you can see maybe their altars and their statutes to all the people uh, that they were worshiping and uh, idolizing. And Paul steps on the scene and he says, I found an altar uh, with an inscription to the unknown God. In other words, they were so religious. Uh, <coughs> and that's what he means by superstitious. He's not being... Uh, he's not beating them over the head and, and, and speaking down to them there. He's telling them, I think you're too religious. You're worshiping everything in the world. Uh, and you've even got an altar over here to a God that you don't know just in case there is another one. So you don't offend him. Paul said, I'm going to declare him unto you. Notice Paul, what Paul says. He says, whom therefore you ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. Now, Paul didn't say, I'm going to describe him. Paul didn't say that I'm going to uh, uh, define who he is. Paul said, I am going to declare who he is. 
Amen. There's a big difference between defining and describing. I'm not here to define for you uh, what you need. I'm here to declare what the Word of God says. Amen. And Paul goes on and he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is likened to gold, or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from them, from among them, howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionys Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So uh, there's what Paul preached. And now I want you to understand something. I want you to grasp this. I want you to get because this is a great blessing. Throughout the book of Acts, we find accounts where Paul preaches to Gentiles and where he preaches to Jews. And when Paul preaches to the Jews, he preaches to them and declares unto them the Scripture, the Old Testament, and he preaches Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. Amen. But here he stepped into a learned city, uh, and he's talking primarily to Jews, Gentiles, and uh, uh, we've got to count Brother Lamar of the Epicureans and the Stoics. They would be Gentiles. And, and rather than going to the Old Testament, which they wouldn't know anything about, Paul appeal, appeals to them from their own learning. In other words, uh, uh, they think they know where man came from, and they think they know something about God, and Paul steps on the scene and says, I'm going to declare unto you who God really is. Uh, uh, he didn't appeal to them uh, from the Scriptures, talking about the Old Testament. He appealed to them from creation. Uh, and rather than saying, listen to me, uh, he said, you think you've got this thing figured out? You think you can take and make God uh, uh, listen to me? Uh, uh, he says in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Uh, uh, he's not talking to them about the Old Testament. He's going to account to them creation. They think they know who God is, and they had missed the mark. And he's telling I'm going to tell you who God is. God made the world and all things therein. He's Lord of heaven and earth, and he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Thank God for that. He's not worshipped by the product of man's hands. In other words, Paul's getting across to them the point. Now, I want you to get this. I want this to settle. Paul is telling them, we don't make God. God made us. Amen? We don't make God. God made us. In verse number, uh, tw in verse numbers twenty, verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine, he says, "For in him we live and move and have our being." Verse number twenty-nine says, "For as much as then we, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device." So Paul's preaching to them, and he's telling them, he said, "Look, you think you can make God and 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 carve him out of stone." and pour him in brass and bronze and worship that. He said, that's not the way God is. God made you. And that, don't let this offspring of God thing throw you off right here. There's a, there's a thought going around uh, that, we're the, uh, that we're the brotherhood, uh, uh, fatherhood of God and, the, and, that sort, and brotherhood of man. And, we, and Let me get this right. There's a thought going around that says we're the uh, offspring of God. He's our father. We're all brothers. And by that, they're saying, you don't need to be regenerated. We're all the children of God. That's a false doctrine. The doctrine is that we must be saved. Amen. What the Bible teaches is that 
uh, here when he's saying we're the offspring of God. He's saying we are his creation. He created and made us. We do not create and make him. There's a Boy, I tell you, I don't want to worship something that I put together. Do you? Anybody ever build anything? Let me ask you something. How long did it last? And I know a lot of you are good builders, and you can make things, and they last. I build things, and they'll last a little while, and a lot of times they'll fall apart, and they need to be repaired, and you're in the same boat, too. Everything that we build by our hands will eventually come to naught. Everything that we put together uh, uh, and, and man's device and man's architect all put together, the greatest buildings in the world have to be repaired at some point in time. We don't make God. He makes us. Amen. What we build falls apart. What God does lasts forever. And that's the message God sends through the Apostle Paul. But verse number 26 is what I want you to really focus upon. The Bible says he hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. In this great day that we're standing before you and how everything has come together is amazing to me. Here we are, we're, we're celebrating our veterans and honoring them. All right, as well we should. That's to, this is veteran. We're gonna have Veterans Day on Friday, and this is the last service we'll have. So we're gonna celebrate and honor our veterans. We've talked about the Gideons and the work that they're doing in our nation, in our uh, state, and across the world. And then uh, here we are, two days away from what people are calling the greatest and most important election, not in our lifetime, but in the history of our nation. Two days away from a great event that our nation has a chance, listen to me now, to either turn back to God or continue on a path away from God. We've got a chance now, and I, you might say, well, I, I'm, not pre I'm not telling you how to vote. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm going to tell you this, though. I, well, let me back up. I'm going to say this. I, I won't tell you who to vote for, but I'll tell you this morning, if you're a Christian and you're a child of God, you ought to be led by your faith and by the Word of God who to vote for. Amen. Uh, uh, we ought to pray about it because it is an important thing uh, uh, and it's a, a chance now to see whether our country is going to turn. The Sunday school lesson was about judgment coming upon the nation of Israel. We've been studying it for several weeks out of the prophet Joel and Amos. How judgment's going to come. But I thank God uh, uh, in the book of Joel, the Bible tells us uh, in the book of Joel, I believe it's chapter number 2, maybe verse number 25. I could be wrong about that. Uh, uh, but it's in the book of Joel, and I'll find it in a minute if you need me to. Uh, uh, but the Bible tells us that God tells them through Joel uh, uh, that he would restore the years that the locust had eaten. What's he saying? If you'll turn back to me, I'll bless you and I'll recover that that you've lost. If we'll turn back to God, God will bless America. Amen. We've seen God bless America. I can tell you that God has blessed America. But pending blessings are, are but let me say it, future blessings are pending our repentance as a nation. We're going to see a, a, a life given uh, uh, over to God and a nation given back to God. Uh, then it's going to take us repenting and us as a people of faith, uh, uh, standing up for our faith and doing something about it. Amen. Uh, it's not time for us to stand, uh, uh, stand on the sidelines and watch anymore. It's time for us to take our country back. It's time for us to uh, do what God wants us to do, to stand on the corners, to declare the gospel, and to say, you must must be born again. It's not time uh, for us to uh, sit idly by. I was telling, we were uh, went to Gatlinburg last weekend, went to Pigeon Forge and spent the weekend and went to church there in Cage Cove with Mount Gillard, had a wonderful time. And Sunday afternoon, we went back to uh, Pigeon Forge and we're walking around. We went through a store, and I won't call the name of the store, it doesn't matter. But it was an expensive store. It was a, a kind of an upscale kind of store. And uh, you could buy just about anything you wanted and uh, for hiking and camping and things like that. And uh, most everything in there was what I thought was very expensive. Uh, uh, and, and I told a, a friend of mine there with me, I said, if you look at what's happening in this store, uh, America's become a nation of a bunch of spoiled rich kids. Amen. Uh, uh, we've got to have a $150 pair of pants just to go out in the woods. Uh, 
Uh, we got to have $300 boots just to take a hike, amen. Uh, uh, we can't sit in a folding lawn chair anymore. We got to have a $150 reclining rocker when we put our feet up and have a sunshade over our head, amen. Uh, uh, we've gotten past what God wanted us to be, which was a light to a lost and dying world. Uh, and we've gotten to the point where we're sitting at ease in Zion uh, and we're taking comfort, amen, uh, 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 over quality. We're taking comfort over Christ, amen. Uh, uh, we'd rather be uh, uh, comfortable in what we do rather than have Christ in the center of our lives. Right. And, what, and I'm, not, I'm just saying us as people of faith in the church and the house of God this morning, it's time for us to uh, do like what our forefathers did and afflict ourselves a little bit and say, we're not going that way. Uh, we're, gonna, uh, uh, we're not going to be people uh, that only seek comfort. It may cost us a little bit. We may have to not have some of the treasures and pleasures of life, uh, but we're going to stand with God. Amen. Now, how do you get all that out of this message, out of this passage of Scripture? He says that God hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. He's talking about nations. Amen. Now, I believe we all love the passage in the book of Esther where Esther tells Mordecai after she determines in her heart, she says, I'm going to go, uh, uh, well, uh, Mordecai's talking to Esther, trying to get Esther to go in and talk to the king and say, look, we've got to do something. All the Jews are going to die. And Esther heme hauls around and says, I don't want to do it. And finally she prays and says, listen, I'll go, and I'll, if I perish, I perish. But Mordecai had told her and said, look, who knows but what you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. We love that. All right? And can I tell you this morning that you've got such a time as this? Your bound of your habitation, your sphere of influence, your sphere of life has been numbered and marked by God. The day you were born, the day you're going to die, the life and breath that you live in between those times, amen. Where you go, who you cross, uh, who you marry, uh, your children, all of that's been determined. God knows that beforehand, amen. Uh, uh, Jeremiah said, before I was formed in the womb, you knew me, Lord. My sphere bumps into yours and our paths cross. But listen, uh, uh, my, what I do is limited in life. God's put a limit on that. Limit of where I go and what I'm going to do. God has put a limit on that, amen. And God knows what's going to happen, Brother Anthony, within the sphere of my life. But that goes to nations too, amen. God's put a sphere of influence in our, of our nation. And our nation won't go past the day God has appointed for it. Amen. And God can shorten our days and God can lengthen our days based on what we do for Him. And God set the bounds and the influence of the United States of America. And I'll say from the pulpit this morning to anybody that wants to take this, and don't challenge me on it because I'd hate to show you up, amen. Uh, but I'm going to tell you right now, and I'll tell every politician in the United States today that America was founded on the principles of the Word of God. Amen. We are a Christian nation. God founded this thing. God put it together. I've got pinned down in the back of my Bible. I, I, I wrote it down because I love it. I go back and I refer to it every once in a while. But in the back of my Bible, I have pinned down every word in the Mayflower Compact. The very first time in the history of humanity that men and women voluntarily united together and submitted themselves unto a government. Voluntarily did it. It begins like this, in the name of God. That ought to set the stage for things, doesn't it? Now this is in the name of God, okay? The second paragraph begins like this. This is the foundation of our country. Before the pilgrims stepped foot off the Mayflower. Listen to me, kids. You're going to be studying Thanksgiving, I hope, in school. And you're going to hear about the Mayflower. But I'm going to tell you what you're not going to hear. Before they, set, before they stepped foot off the Mayflower, they signed a piece of parchment paper. They all come into agreement and said, we're going to band ourselves together into one political party, into one government, and we're going to do it in the name of God. And this is their mission. It says, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, 
a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves into a, together into a civil body politic. In other words, what they were saying, we're going to unite together in a, in a civil body. We're going to have a civil government. We're going to have a civil, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a, a civilization. But it's going to be for the advancement of the Christian religion and to honor God. That was their covenant. They made that together. Let me just tell you how God works now. Let me just show you how God puts things together. Okay, that document on the Mayflower was signed, get this, on November the 11th, 1620. November the 11th is Veterans Day now in the United States. We honor our veterans on November the 11th. But I'm telling you right now, Veterans, I thank God for your service. I thank God that you've helped secure that and preserve that for me. I thank God that you've made it possible. Uh, uh, but Veterans Day has a special meaning to me uh, because it was the day uh, uh, that men signed and devoted their lives and said, I'm going to make a place uh, uh, for my offspring and my children and them that come after me to worship God uh, uh, the way that we want to worship God. Amen. And they made that in agreement. Our veterans have preserved it. Amen. And God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Let me tell you something. Our world today, uh, uh, our country today it is divided. Uh, uh, people, uh, people groups, black are fighting white. White are fighting black. Uh, uh, just this week. Now, just this week. I, I, uh, uh, listen, we, we know this week what has happened. We've got an uprise. We've got people screaming anti-Semitic. That's against Jews. Amen. In our country, we've got a, a, a way people upset about anti-Semitic behavior. They ought to be. Amen. We've got North Korea flying airplanes over the 38th parallel. South Korea and the United States scrambling fighters to intercept them. Okay. We've got a war in the Ukraine right now. Russia, uh, the largest country in Europe, has invaded the second largest country in Europe. All right, you couldn't. I ain't got the rest of. I ain't got enough heartbeats left, probably, to talk about what's going on in the Middle East and all the trouble there. In other words, there's discord everywhere you look, and all we hear from all our politicians, all we hear from world, po we've got to love one another. We've got to have peace. I've got news for you. The God of all peace and glory laid out the example for us. He gave us the recipe to have peace in our time. He gave us the recipe, uh, uh, Brother Anthony, of how to live together, how to love one another, how to be on good terms with one another. And guess what? Our Supreme Court kicked it out in 1963 and said, we don't need to teach people that. Well, listen, if you'd been teaching them that for the last 60 years, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. Amen. He said we, God had made of one blood, all nations of men, people screaming today, they want peace, they want the, the people groups of the world, the whites to live with blacks in peace, blacks to live with whites, everybody to live with Jews, uh, uh, Arabs, all of them to live in peace. And God gave us the example to live by. God gave us the direction for that. And we're all of one blood. That may not make people feel warm and fuzzy in a Baptist church in the hills of Appalachia, northeast Georgia, but we're all the same, amen? I don't care what you, you can trace back as far as you want to, but we all go back to Adam and Eve. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. Come right down to it then, and after the flood, we're all descendants of, of Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We're all related. And let me just give you something to really think about. We talk about one human race. Oh, that's going to get quiet, ain't it? 
the only, and I know people grew, I know, I know there have been feuds. You can read about them in the Bible when, when, when one group of people did not like the other group of people and they went to fighting. I understand that. Okay? But let me say this for you. You're not going to hear this on the news and you're not going to read this on the newspaper and you're not going to find it on the internet much unless you look in the right places. But racism and races and racial teaching is a product of evolutionary theory. Amen. Evolutionary theory says that the different races of people, they call it, evolved from different species. Some higher species and some lower. Y'all learned that in school, didn't you? They told you all that, didn't they? No, they didn't. When they teach racial uh, injustice and they talk about social uh, injustice and social equality, it's in the Bible. We're all made the same. We all come from the same person. We're all descendants of Adam and we're all descendants of, of Noah and his three sons. Uh, and listen, if we would get back to the things of God in our country uh, and we would let the people of faith, amen, uh, uh, get back to where we worship God and uh, the people of God weren't afraid to come, uh, uh, listen, out onto the doorstep and declare the things of God to be right and true, amen, uh, uh, we wouldn't have the problems we got today. And God's made us all of one blood and he set our bounds, amen, and we're not going to cross over. Those bounds deal with time and place. Amen. God put us over here on this continent by ourselves and said, I don't want you to leave there. Don't want you to get mixed up in their affairs, but here's what I do want you to do. I want you to be a witness. I want you to be a light. I want you to preach the word and send missionaries. I want you to share the word of God. I want you to send Bibles out. And that's what America did for about just almost 200 years. Almost 200 years, and then we got caught up with wealth and prosperity and decided we'd rather have money than morals. Amen. We decided we'd rather, have, uh, we'd rather fight one another than stand against the wiles of the devil. And here we are. We're in trouble this morning. But we've got a chance in our country to take back and do something about it. We've got a chance. You need to vote. Amen. You need to pray and vote. We need to be wrapped up in our government. We need to be wrapped up uh, in prayer in our government and in our country. We need to be praying for our leaders. Listen, I don't know about you. I find it very hard to pray for some people. I'll just be admittedly honest. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm kind of like that prayer, you know, that song, that country song that says, I pray that a flower pot falls on your head. That's kind of the way I feel every once in a while. Amen? But when's the... Last time we just prayed and said, I want my president to be saved. Maybe my vice president gets saved. Maybe Congress and those on the Supreme Court to get saved. That'd make a difference in our country, amen. If folks that are in authority would get saved and would worship God, we'd see a change of things. We'd see things different. And we've had saved uh, we've had saved presidents in the past. We've had saved leaders in the past. The majority of our forefathers, amen, were statesmen, not politicians. A politician goes into office to see what he can get for himself. A statesman goes into office to see how he can make his country better. What do we have today? I want, I want some statesmen, don't you, and women. I want some people that will be there for the betterment of our country. And how are we going to better our country? Get back to the things of God. We've got all the technology. Listen, technology isn't going to fix it. We've seen that. Money isn't going to fix it. We, uh, Two trillion dollars worth of spending being thrown around. It, it isn't going to fix it. It makes the problems worse. Amen. What we need is to get back to the things of God, a, a prayer life and a Bible reading time, a, and time when we are devoted, amen, to God because he's made us all one blood and get back to where we love people and want to share the gospel with them and see them get saved. Because God has put us here for such a time as this. God told Daniel, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter number 2. Let me turn over there in case I misquote it. In Daniel chapter number 2 he said, and he changed it, talking about God. Let me read the whole thing here. It said, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. 
and he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. In chapter number 4, Daniel speaks to Nebuchadnezzar again. And he says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the lit, listen to this now, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. In other words, God's ruling, every, God's in control. I, I've said this many times. I've talked about this many times. Don't you worry. Uh -uh, God's not worried about things, amen. But what we need to do is get back to what God told us to do. Amen. And what did God tell us to do? Be the salt and the light in the generation and time that we're living. Our bounds are not going to go any farther than what God said. In other words, don't, don't, don't ask me. God didn't put me in, in the Pacific Northwest. God didn't put me in the continent of Africa. God didn't put me somewhere else to preach. He put me right here. This is my time. This is where God's put me. This is your time. This is where God's put you. To do God's will and to do God's work, to worship and to please Him. That's our job as a nation. That's our job as a country to lift up. And when we did that, America was a great country. And now America has fallen into what we think is disrepair. We can get back to God. He said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins, and then I like this. I will heal their land. Amen. When he's talking about healing the land, he's talking about a lot of different things. He's talking about fixing things that are broken. All right? You look around. Everything in our society is broken. I mean, we've got a shortage of this. Uh, look, listen. What's going on? I, I'm going to be honest with you. I used to like being able, with the click of a mouse, ordering and finding anything I want. Amen? You could, now, I'm not saying spend all the money in the world, but I'm saying if I, I wanted to find something, I could get on the internet, I could find it, I could order it. Two, three, four, five days, I could have it at the house. Now you get on the internet and want something. I'm so tired of clicking on things that says out of stock. I'm mad. Ain't you? Why? Because this thing can't get from here to there because this people over here is on strike and this people over here is mad and this people over here can't work because there's a flood and you can't get a shipment up the Mississippi River because it's drying up. Amen. You think about everything that's broken in our society right now God can fix if his people would just get back to worshiping him and praying to him. You know, we don't need but, but let me say something. Let me say all that stuff. I ain't gone hungry yet. I ain't gone naked yet. My house still dry, warm. The things that I need, I still got. All right? Listen to me. The things that I need, I still have, and the chances are you do too. God's still taking care of us. But we could have so much better. We could have a country that is honoring God. God right now this very hour and the nations of the world would be looking at us saying my goodness how are y'all doing Amen. and all we'd have to say is it's not us it's God Amen. just give him the honor and the glory that he deserves on the battlefield on the Manassas battlefield General Stonewall Jackson said this on the battlefield now, if you've never read anything about Stonewall Jackson, I haven't read a whole lot, but everything I do, I like. Amen. One of his eldest assistants said this about him. He said, I always knew we were heading to a big battle by the number of times he got up in the middle of the night to pray. One soldier penned these words, something to this effect, said, nothing ever affected me more on the battlefield than seeing the bullet ride around and Stonewall Jackson on his horse with his eyes lifted to heaven praying. But he said this on a battlefield in Manassas. He said, Oh God, let this horrible war quickly come to an end. 
that we may all return home and engage in the only work that is worthwhile, and that is the salvation of men. Well, wouldn't you like to pray this morning? God, let this, all this horror, all this mess around us, God, come to an end. That we can get back to serving you and worshiping you and seeing men, women, boys, and girls get saved. Wouldn't you like to, wouldn't you like to not have to turn, wouldn't you like to turn on the news and not hear about another murder? I mean, you couldn't keep up with the murder report. You ain't got enough time uh, to track all the horrible things that are happening in our societies right now. And it's all because we have forsook God. Here in Athens, Paul said, I'm going to declare unto you the unknown God. You know what we need to do? We need to step out as people of faith to a lost and dying world around us and declare unto them an unknown God. They don't know him. They don't know why America is the way it is. They don't know the history. It's not been taught to them. We've got a job to do to share a gospel an unknown God with a lost and dying world. Don't look at me and say everybody in America knows who God is. I would contend with you that the majority of people in America don't know who God is. Amen. And it's a shame. It's a shame. Brother Doug told us how many, how many gospel testaments or how many Bibles they've given out in this past year at Gold Rush and the different places. I hope and pray every one of them reaches and touches somebody and they get saved. Don't you? What a difference 2,000 people getting saved in Lumpkin County would make. Amen? What a difference. You say it can't happen. You don't know my God. He saved 2,000 on one day at one service. Next time they preached, uh, I, I read where Peter preached, and 3,000 got saved. Amen? It can happen. If we'll just turn our minds and our hearts back to God. He's made us all of one race, and he set our bands. Amen? And we're here for this time. What are we going to do with it? As we step out in this next week with all these important events ahead of us, look, I know what time of year it is. I've told you 15 years. I know I haven't. I've told you 14 years. Now's the 15th year. Amen. It's the greatest time of the year. Thanksgiving and December, Christmas, that's the greatest time of the year. November and December, I love it better than anything. But Brother Anthony, if we don't get back to God, something, if we don't get back where we need to be with God, as God's people, we've got a job to do. And that's to lift up God to a lost and dying nation. We, I'm so thankful this morning for what God's done and the souls he saved and what we've seen done. But I'm hungry. Listen, don't you? I've had an appetizer. I want something. I want more. You say, aren't you satisfied? If I ever get satisfied on God, I hope he takes me home. Amen. I want to be hungry. I want to want more. I want more from God than I've ever had. Not personally, not, not the things of this world, more of his presence, more of his spirit. When I step upon the grounds outside, I want to feel God's blood all over me. Amen. I want it to be that people riding up down the road are drawn to this place to see and to feel God. And it can happen again. Because it's happened before. As we stand all over the house. That message has been scattered, I know. But I've tried to declare God to you this morning. I've tried to preach about the unknown God in us and our job. This morning, I let me ask the question. Do you know who God is? Do you know who Christ is? Have you ever been saved? If you've never been saved, this morning be the time you need to come and say, Lord, please save me. Save me from what? Save me from the awful judgment that is to come. We are a judgment-bound people. And one day the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We're all going to stand before God one day. Do you want to stand before God just like you are? Or do you want somebody there speaking on your behalf, an advocate named Christ saying, He's saved. She's saved. They're mine. Are you ready to go and do for God? You can't go for God until you get saved. And then if you are saved and you've lost a little of that desire, a little of that zeal, maybe this invitation's for you this morning. As we sing, Lamar, what's your number? Page 45.